So how do you know if your special needs trust for your loved one is valid? What can make that trust invalid? In today's video, we're going to be talking about the top five special needs trust pitfalls. Hello and welcome to my channel. My name is Ellen Cookman and I'm an estate planning attorney who specializes in special needs planning. On this channel, we're going to talk about how to set up a special needs trust to protect your loved one who has special needs. We'll talk about the importance of setting up a trust, what's the difference between a regular trust and a special needs trust, regular estate planning, a revocable living trust, how to avoid probate, trust administration, and many other relevant topics. If this information sounds useful to you, please consider subscribing and hitting the notification bell so that you'll be notified when new videos come out every week. I'm a certified specialist in estate planning, and my law firm has helped hundreds of families navigate the complicated process of setting up their estate plan with special needs components. I'm excited to share all of the knowledge that we've learned over the years with you. So let's talk about the first pitfall that I see a lot with special needs trusts that have been drafted. The first one is how the discretionary distribution language is written. So what do I mean by that? In the trust, basically you're writing to the trustee, here's how the money should be spent for the beneficiary. We call that the distribution language, okay? And what's pretty typical to put in many trusts is something we call the HEM standard. We say that the trust assets can be used for health, education, maintenance, and support, H-E-M-S, or HEMS. And that's a, that's a pretty popular language because you think that covers a whole lot of things. Now it doesn't cover everything, right? It doesn't cover gambling or around the world cruises, but it covers most things that, think, that people need. Now here's the challenge though. If that type of language is included in a California special needs trust, that typically invalidates the trust. Now you might say, why would that be? Well, here's the reason. There's court decisions that have said that everybody is entitled to something for their health, education, maintenance, and support, right? We all need something to support that. And because of that, the assets in a special needs trust or in a trust that, that has the HEMS language is considered accountable asset for public benefits purposes. So if you see that language in a special needs trust, run far away, run to a, a special needs attorney who knows how to draft things. Because what you should see in a special needs trust is that this money can be used for anything and everything according to the trustee's full discretion. The trustee has full and absolute discretion over all distributions. So this means that the money can be used for everything and it can be used for nothing. Theoretically, the trustee could distribute nothing to the beneficiary. And because of that limitation, it's not counted as the beneficiary's money for public benefits purposes. For certain public benefits, you have to have under $2,000 of countable assets to be able to qualify. And, and if you have uh, money in a trust that has HEM standard language, that counts as the beneficiary's own money. Now they have over $2,000 of countable assets and they're disqualified from, uh, usually it's Supplemental Security Income, SSI, and Medi-Cal, which is California's version of the federal Medicaid system, the health insurance program. So you don't want that to happen. So make sure that your special needs trust has that fully discretionary language that the trustee has full discretion over everything to be used for the beneficiary however the trustee sees fit. Okay, so the next thing that the trust should say is that the trust assets are meant to supplement but not supplant whatever the beneficiary is already receiving from the government. So for example, let's say that you have a child who's on the autism spectrum and there's a really great doctor who specializes in certain types of treatment. And yet that doctor does not accept Medi-Cal. And by the way, most doctors do not accept Medi-Cal. You can still use the trust money for going to that really specialized doctor and it still is valid under the trust because the trust says it's to supplement anything that the child's already receiving. So the child can go to a doctor that receives Medi-Cal 
or accepts Medi-Cal, but the child can also go somewhere that does not accept Medi-Cal. It's just that the trust is not supposed to be paying the Medi-Cal payments. Another pitfall I see in some special needs trusts is that I see a third party special needs trust drafted that includes a Medi-Cal payback provision. So let me explain why this is really, really bad. All right, so a third party special needs trust is a trust that somebody else has set up for the beneficiary. This is our typical special needs trust. You know, your parent or grandparent has set it up and then it's funded and the child uses the money and, or sorry, the trustee uses the money for the child's benefit all through their lifetime. And then upon their death, the money goes wherever the trust says. Medi-Cal does not get to get its money back upon the child's death. Now compare that to the first party special needs trust, which is the child's own money, all right? A first party special needs trust can be set up to receive money that the child maybe received as an outright inheritance or received through a settlement. That money can be put into a first party special needs trust, but the first party special needs trust must have the Medi-Cal payback language that says upon the beneficiary's death, Medi-Cal gets their money back. They can bring a claim and get that money and then anything that's remaining in the first party special needs trust after the Medi-Cal reimbursement claim goes wherever the trust says. So sometimes attorneys get this confused and they'll say, hey, let's put the Medi-Cal payback provisions in the third party special needs trusts. That should not be done. That can actually lead to malpractice for an attorney. So make sure that that's not in your third party special needs trust. Another pitfall that I often find in special needs trusts is that the disabled beneficiary is able to act as successor trustee of the special needs trust. This is completely forbidden. In order for a special needs trust to qualify as a non-countable resource, so that the beneficiary still only has $2,000 in the bank account and the special needs trust money doesn't count as a countable asset. The reason why a special needs trust works is because the beneficiary does not have direct access to the money. There's a gatekeeper set up. There's a, a trustee who's, who's managing it and the beneficiary can't demand the money. They can't say, hey, I need $3,000 right now, pay it up. They can't do that. If there's any way that the beneficiary can become successor trustee, then the government can say, this is an invalid trust, sorry. So the trust should have language saying, notwithstanding anything else written in the trust, Johnny, the beneficiary, is not to act as trustee of this trust. It should include that language. So definitely look for that language and make sure that the beneficiary is not listed or is not able to be named as successor trustee. The last pitfall that I want to talk about with special needs trusts is not necessarily a drafting error, but it's more how the trust is set up. I see a lot of families go to a regular estate planner who has some formulaic language that they add to the revocable trust. So it says in their revocable trust, it says, okay, upon Jenny's death, his portion goes to his special needs trust. And then the special needs trust is what we call a testamentary special needs trust. It only springs into being upon the death of both parents, or if it's a single settler of the one parent, okay? But what happens if grandpa wants to leave some money to Johnny in his own estate plan, right? That testamentary special needs trust is not up and running yet. It can't be funded, right? So this is really problematic. So we usually suggest to create a standalone special needs trust, one that is created and it can be funded immediately. Now, usually the parent doesn't need to fund it immediately because while the parent's alive, the parent is the child's special needs trust, but somebody else might want to fund it. So for more flexibility, I say create a standalone special needs trust. Don't put, don't just embed some special needs trust language in your revocable trust, which by the way, most of the times when that language is embedded, it's, it's just bare bones. It doesn't have all the instructions that you need to provide to the trustee. So I say do a standalone special needs trust. So perhaps you've heard 
of another pitfall with special needs planning, and you're wondering if that will affect your child's special needs trusts, I ask you to please write that in the comments below so we can address that. For further information on setting up a fully valid special needs trust, I have a full length webinar that you can click on the link below and access that webinar to get some great information. So be sure to check out this video right here on how to set up a special needs trust. That'll provide you some great information. I'll see you at the next one.